There are over 50 known murder victims in total from 1968 to 2004 on or near the bordering trails of New Hampshire and Vermont. But knowing enough to identify the killer of all of these victims still remains a mystery. On October 24, 1978, Kathy Milliken, a young 27-year-old woman, had been enjoying her day while photographing birds at the Chandler Brook Wetland Preserve in New London, New Hampshire. The next day, her body was found a few yards away. She had around 29 stab wounds. Two years later, on July 25, 1981, 37-year-old Mary Elizabeth Critchley, a student at the University of Vermont, had disappeared near Interstate 91, near the Vermont border. She had been hitchhiking her way to Waterbury, Vermont. On August 9, 1981, one month later, her body was found in a wooded area near Unity, New Hampshire. Given the condition of her body, the medical examiner could not pinpoint the exact cause of death. All that was visible were the stab wounds on her body. 16-year-old nurse's aide Bernice Cordemanchi vanished on May 30th, 1984. It was said that she had been trying to hitchhike a ride to her boyfriend's house near Route 12. Two years later, her remains were found in Kellyville, New Hampshire on April 9th, 1986. Upon further investigation, her remains had uncovered knife wounds to her neck. She also suffered blunt force trauma to the head. On July 20th, 1984, Ellen Freed, a supervising nurse, made a late night phone call at a local payphone when she was kidnapped. Strangely enough, while on the phone with her sister that night, Ellen's sister recollects her telling her that a strange car had been driving back and forth around the area. She was so concerned that she decided to quickly walk over to her car just to check the engine before stepping out again to use the payphone. Her car had been left abandoned on Jervis Road, a few miles away from the payphone that she used to call her sister the night before. On September 19, 1985, her remains were found in Kellyville, New Hampshire. Freed had multiple stab wounds with probable evidence of sexual assault. On July 10, 1985, 27-year-old Eva Morse had gone missing near Charleston, New Hampshire, where it was reported that she had been hitchhiking near Route 12. On April 25, 1986, a logger discovered her remains. Eva Morse had suffered stab wounds to the neck. A few days prior to the discovery of Morse's body, on April 15, 1986, 36-year-old Linda Moore had been gardening in front of her home when she was viciously attacked and killed. Her husband had returned home from work only to find his wife dead with multiple stab wounds. The scene suggests that Moore was fighting for her life. Numerous witnesses at the scene reported seeing a man with a slightly broad appearance. He had dark hair and was wearing a blue book bag. Right before the murders, neighbors reported seeing him hanging around near Moore's residence. He was thought to be between the ages of 20 and 25 years of age, clean shaven while wearing dark rimmed sunglasses. On January 10, 1987, 36 year old nurse Barbara Agnew had been returning home from a ski trip when she decided to stop at a rest area near I 91 in Hartford, Vermont. On March 28, 1987, her car was found abandoned in the same area with the door wide open and blood on the steering wheel. Her body was found near an apple tree in Heartland, Vermont. She was reportedly 10 miles away from home. On August 6, 1988, 22-year-old Jane Borowski was seven months pregnant when she was returning to her car at a rest stop right after purchasing a soda at a vending machine near Winchester. Upon entering her vehicle, Jane notices a man walking back and forth almost around her entire car before the unknown assailant approaches her car, asking about the nearest payphone. After approaching the door, the slasher grabbed Jane's car door, flung it open, and proceeded to attack Jane. While Jane was being attacked, she can vividly remember herself covering her stomach while trying to protect her unborn child. He then pulled out a knife and allegedly claimed to Jane that she had hurt his girlfriend. 
As Jane manages to run out of her car, the suspect then proceeds to run after Jane, stabbing her over 27 times. As Jane stumbled down to the ground, the suspect quickly walked over to his car and drove away, leaving Jane to die near her car. While the suspect drives off, Jane manages to crawl back into her car where she manages to drive two miles en route, 32, to a friend's house for help. En route, she was horrified to find out that she was driving right behind the suspect. Right after rushing to her friend's aid, the attacker makes a U-turn at the residence and drives off. Borowski suffered a severed jugular vein, a kidney laceration, two collapsed lungs, and severed tendons on both her knee and her thumb. Fortunately, both she and her unborn child survived the attack. Criminal psychologist John Philpin was brought in to help while the investigation stood at a standstill. John Philpin started his criminal profiling case by scoping through the area where Ellen and Bernice's bodies were both found in the hopes of trying to gain a better understanding of the suspect's mindset while at the time of the murders. Philpin's belief is that the suspect pre-selects these areas before trying to lure and scare victims into the manipulative trap. While under hypnosis performed and supervised by Philpin himself, Jane manages to describe the suspect as coming off as cool and collected. She also remembers the suspect losing interest in pursuing to attack her when she claims to have stopped forcefully defending herself. Philpin also gets Jane to recollect the suspect's car and license number. Jane recalls the suspect having a 75 to 85 Jeep Wagoneer. She also remembers seeing the numbers 662 on the suspect's license plate. As police officers try their best to narrow down the search, they managed to bring down the suspects to 350. Unfortunately, they were unable to get a viable suspect or leads. It is known that an Idaho law enforcement officer saw the composite sketch of the suspect and called officials where he reported an inmate at the Idaho State Penitentiary matching the description of the suspect. Till this day, it is unknown whether or not anything came from this lead. On first at 5.30, more than 20 years have passed with few answers about a series of murders in the Connecticut River Valley. People in that area suspect it was the work of a serial killer. In the late 1970s and through the 80s, several women disappeared around the Claremont area and in nearby Vermont. The Attorney General's office says it still can't be certain how many cases are related. Today, a state lawmaker tried drawing new attention to it all. Heather Hamill live now, and Heather, this attempt didn't get much traction. Well, that's true, Jean, because Representative Steve Lindsay, who introduced the bill, recommended killing it as well. No one other than Lindsay even spoke for or against it, and in the end, his unusual way of going about this was questioned by committee members. In the late 70s and 1980s, the crime shook the very core of the Connecticut River Valley. At least seven women stabbed and murdered. In 2011, still no arrests. Keen Representative Steve Lindsay says he wants answers and justice. And women uh, without too many ties, uh, women that were easy, easily forgotten. I'd like to reignite uh, interest in the case and I'd like to uh, bring some resolution. Lindsay introduced a bill that would give the state's cold case unit $200,000 to exhume the victims of the so-called Connecticut River Valley killer and perform DNA testing. But in an unusual move, Lindsay asked for action that would essentially eliminate the bill, a decision after he did further study. Seven victims were found in advanced states of decay and uh, unfortunately uh, I have been told by professionals the DNA wouldn't be that effective. Before you filed the bill, did you talk to the cold case unit in the AG's office to see if they wanted this bill? Nope, I just went ahead and gave you an letter. Some representatives called that inappropriate. If I didn't go through the right channels and some people got their backs up, well, I'm sorry, but uh, I want some results, and that's why I'm here, to look for results, to have results, to give those families an answer. The AG's office tells us it can't say whether all the murders were connected. The cases of four of the women are listed on the cold case website. Catherine Milliken was last seen in 1978. Ellen Freed, Eva Morse, and Bernice Cordemage all disappeared between 84 and 86. All were stabbed multiple times. Representative Lindsay says even though his methods were unorthodox, he feels he achieved something. I feel uh, it lights a little fire. I flicked my back 
under the cauldron of indifference, and maybe we'll, we'll draw interest again. Now, no one from the Attorney General's office showed up for the hearing. The committee ultimately agreed to kill the bill, as Lindsay recommended. Reporting live, Heather Hamill, WMUR News 9. Police have also indicated that another known suspect by the name of Michael Nicolau, an Army veteran from the Vietnam War, also matches the physical description of the suspect. Unfortunately, in 2005, he killed his wife and stepdaughter before taking his own life. During the time of the murders, it is said that Michael Nicolau lived near Hollyoke, Massachusetts. His wife had close relatives living in Vermont. Interstate 91 was also relatively close to his home. Michael is also known to have lived relatively close to Cordomanchi, Freed, and Morse at the time of all three murders. Police have become unlucky in finding any physical evidence linking Michael to the case. The evidence they have is circumstantial, linking him to Jane's description of the suspect. DNA collected in all cases had been deemed inconclusive. Two other suspects named in the case were Delbert Tallman and Gary Westover. Delbert had confessed to killing a woman named Heidi Martin back in 1984. Her death was similar to that of the victims of the Connecticut River murders. Not too long after, Delbert recanted his statement and was acquitted of the confessed murder. Gary Westover had later admitted to police that he was responsible for the killing of Barbara Agnew, along with a few other men who were all allegedly involved in helping to abduct and kill Agnew, the last known victim of the Connecticut River slasher. For all we know, there could be more unidentified victims out there. In August of 2006, one of Westover's family members wrote to Ann Agnew, Barbara Agnew's sister, with information given to Grafton County Sheriff's Deputy Howard Minnan. Family members of Agnew believe that Michael Nicolau and Westover both might have played an involvement in the murders, according to his uncle Minnan. Upon further speculation, it's believed that Nicolau and Westover may have been acquainted with one another at a local VA hospital. None of these speculations have been confirmed. Two more victims would later resurface before the end of the decade. On May 20th, 1984, 16-year-old Heidi Martin went for a jog on Martinsville Road. The very next day, her body was found behind Heartland Elementary School. She was stabbed to death and raped. Not a surprise that Agnew's crime was committed about a mile away from where Heidi's body was found. On June 24, 1988, decomposing body parts were found, dumped alongside Route 78 in Warwick, less than a mile away from the border in New Hampshire. The dismembered parts were believed to be that of a young white woman. She was believed to be average in height with an athletic body type. On July 25, 1989, 14-year-old Carrie Moss left her home to visit friends in Goffstown and disappeared. Two years later, on July 24, 1991, her remains were found in a wooded area not too far from home. Cause of death was undetermined, but it is speculated that she was a victim of the Connecticut River Valley murderer. If you have any information regarding the Connecticut River Valley murders or any of these missing women on screen, please contact New Hampshire State Police at 603-271-2663 or Vermont State Police at 802-241-5355. You can remain anonymous.